And one of the ways that God showed us his National Commission to South Africa, we saw 6,080 people give their life to Christ on their one mission trip. It's not just about a local ministry, it's a global ministry. God has told us to go on mission with him. So I want to invite you all to come on mission trip with us one day, uh, real soon, uh, with the International Commission Group, and you too will see God's glory show up in your life. Amen. Since 1999, Impact Stewardship has been helping churches build houses of worship. One of the most trusted ministry resources, Impact has helped raise over $950 million to expand ministry space, enhance domestic and international missions outreach, and retire inhibiting church debt. They stood out head and shoulders above the rest. When you're looking to raise dollars, you're serious about building you need to talk to Impact Stewardship. They will be a great blessing to your church and to your ministry. I promise you. Glory here in Dallas, Texas. And we're here to let people know about the upcoming event that's going to happen at the American Airlines Center. It's called Harvest America. From the American Airlines Center, the gospel is going to go out around the United States of America and abroad. So I want to encourage you to be praying for this event and be thinking about how you can utilize this amazing tool we're going to put into your hands or you can bring the gospel into your church sanctuary, into a local theater, into an arena, or even your front room. And I want to personally invite you to sign up today and become a host site for Harvest America. God bless you, and God bless America. God has called us to a serious business, taking His salvation to the ends of the earth. What are we going to do about it? Have you been born again? My hope is an opportunity for Christians to invite the people in our lives who we know don't have the same hope that we have in Jesus Christ and watch this program on television. Jesus Christ is alive. He's here tonight and he'll come into your life. They just accepted Christ in the main life. With internet evangelism, we can go to countries that I would never be able to visit. We can go anytime, day or night. In the midst of disaster, there's an emotional and spiritual care component. And as chaplains, that's what we're called to focus on. Let's take the gospel to the ends of the earth in this generation.
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Now there came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. Now he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, and yet his own did not receive him. But to all who received him, to everyone who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning Him. He cries out, saying, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because He was before me. From the fullness of His grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only who is at the Father's side, has made Him known. Now the next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. Now when his two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. <laughs> Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? Rabbi, they replied, Where are you staying? Come, he said, and you will see. So they went with him and saw where he was staying and spent the day with him. Now Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Christ! And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You shall be called Peter. Now the next day he decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Well, come and see, said Philip. Now when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus replied, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Rabbi, Nathanael said, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? <laughs> you shall see greater things than these. I tell you the truth, you shall see heaven standing open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man.
waited for this day. We've gathered in your name, calling out to you. Glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. Your love is with you. That's right. Your love is with you. prayed for you. We prayed for this time. We prayed for the next, not just the next day and a half, but also just really this, this entire week. And um, uh, again, you have been prayed for. This time has been prayed for. Uh, what we just sang is really in a lot of ways what we're praying for God to do. All right. Uh, that song you just heard, Open Up the Heavens, is kind of a combination between two different prayers in the Bible. One of them is out of Isaiah 64, 1 that says, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down and that the mountains would quake in your presence. It was a plea for God to come down and to show himself strong. And then you flip over into Exodus 33 where God had told Moses he's not going up with them and they were distraught over that. And then right there in verse 18 of the 33rd chapter, 
uh, very short prayer that is the theme of this next day and a half. And he just he pleaded with God. He said, please, please show me your glory. And that's really what we are praying. We're praying that would, uh, that would happen these next days. Uh, pastors, and I'm one of you, pastors oftentimes are uh, the most uh, worn out, uh, discouraged, uh, distraught, sometimes defeated people. And uh, what we're praying for is for God to refresh you, for God to speak to you, not just to have a bunch of uh, meetings, a bunch of sermons, a bunch of music. Uh, we've been blessed for, for some phenomenal communicators. There's going to be the course of tonight as well as uh, all day tomorrow, uh, some of the most effective communicators uh, in the world. Uh, the musicians, and I'm very biased, I get to hear this every uh, single Sunday, uh, and then tomorrow with Matt Redman and the Vertical Church Band, we have been very, very blessed, but please understand this, uh, they are not performers, uh, the speakers are not fancy orators, uh, they are simply mouthpieces, that's what they're to be, they're facilitators, they are uh, very clay vessels that uh, they are asking for God to speak uh, to you uh, through them, and so really what we're asking to do is this. Uh, since I've been in your shoes, and I, I even told the church, I was like, you know, sometimes preachers aren't the easiest ones to preach to. I mean, sometimes preachers will look at you, and, uh, but here's the deal. Uh, show me wrong, all right? Because here's what I want to challenge you to do. It's very easy uh, when you're on the platform. You're distracted a lot about a lot of stuff. You're figuring out, okay, who's the next person up, or, you know, why is that person wearing that, or why is the slide not up? Listen, all that's taken out of your hands. Uh, our prayer for you is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And you're going to get out of the next day and a half what you put into it. All right? If you will engage and uh, not be that guy that you don't like to look at from the platform, you know who I'm talking about? When you're on the platform and that guy's got his arms folded and he is refusing to engage, don't be that guy, okay? Don't be that girl that sits there and you're like, man, that guy's just driving me crazy. Don't be that person. All right? You be the person that engages and is open because... Uh, there's a lot of things God wants to do in your life this week, all right? And it's not just about meetings. It's not just about business. It's not just about renewing some relationships and getting a cup of coffee. You know, all that's fine and good. Uh, but if you're like me, I need God to speak to me. I need a fresh wind. I need God to speak to my life uh, through these vessels this week. So that's what you want to pray. And so I'm going to pray for us here in a few minutes to be uh, just that. You know, our goal uh, is for uh, the Lord Jesus Christ to be lifted up. Uh, in the midst of his people, uh, for us to understand it's about him, it's through him, uh, him proclaimed, adored, uh, and obeyed. And we are blessed also because our, through our sponsors, by the way, uh, our sponsors and their generosity have allowed us uh, to really take care of all the cost, all the offerings, as I'll tell you in a minute, are going to go through a phenomenal cause uh, called Mission Dignity. But let me just say this about our sponsors. Please uh, take the time to go back there. All their booths are back there. Uh, they've all got great stuff that can help your ministries uh, if you're in the, you're like, man, I just need a, an iPad mini. That's all I need. Well, uh, guess what? If you go back there, you can get, uh, you know, page six, all that stuff is spelled out. Uh, visit the booths, drop your little deal in there. And you know, hey, if, uh, if God's in it, you're going to walk away with an iPad mini uh, as well. All right. So, but thank the, thank the sponsors go by there. And, uh, and with that ministry wise, uh, because of their generosity, because of the sponsors, two things. Number one, a part of the ministry back to Baltimore, uh, you'll see in the back there's a uh, display already with many, many blankets. Many of you brought blankets here to give to the area rescue missions. But you, you'll see the display back there. But the main one we're doing is called Mission Dignity, okay? Mission Dignity is a phenomenal ministry through Guidestone. It takes care of the needs, not the wants. It takes care of the very dire needs of, of retired pastors and widows. And uh, I did not know all that much about it until maybe the last four or five months uh, much to my shame, and over the last four or five months, seeing the need that they meet is encouraging, and 100%, 100% of the offerings tomorrow morning and then tomorrow night, 100% of that goes to meet the needs of uh, the pastors and the widows that have gone way before us, and so you guys uh, uh, step up. Okay, don't be that guy as well that doesn't, uh, we're talking to uh, one of our uh, sponsors called PushPay, and uh, you can give two different ways. You can give through the normal offering that'll be passed, but also if some of you are great on your phones, uh, and there'll be a slide behind me. And this, you just all you got to do is text that number, put in PC14, and uh, you can give on your phone. Uh, I thought of all the groups, you know, we all know what it's like to be disappointed when people don't step up and share the resources God has given them. And uh, man, as pastors and ministers of music and all different kinds. Uh, let's be a part of that, all right? Let's be a part of blessing the generation that came uh, before us. Well, tonight, we've got a three 
tremendous gentlemen that uh, love the Lord. One of the things you'll see about all the pastors is, and all the speakers is they love God, they love God's Word, and they love pastors, and they love encouraging you. And uh, Ronnie Floyd's going to be up here in a few minutes. Uh, uh, pastor Ronnie, he is a pastor to pastors, a church of, uh, at Cross Church in Arkansas. Tremendous uh, man, great friend, great encourager to me. H.B. Charles out of Jacksonville, Florida, tremendous expositor. And then a good friend of mine, David Platt, a wonderful pastor out of the Church of Brook Hills. He will uh, kind of close the night out as well. Man, I'm glad you're here. I hope you are as well. All right. uh, can't wait to see what God's going to do. Why don't you bow your heads? Let me pray for us. And then after I say amen, you stand to your feet and uh, you participate. All right. You uh, uh, man, sing. It doesn't matter if you can sing well. It just matters if you participate. All right. So uh, I know the folks in my church like, just sing a little quieter. And uh, it's, it doesn't matter what the guy next to you thinks, how good you can sing. It matters what God thinks tonight. All right. So you, you sing so that God uh, says, that's my boy down there. That's my daughter down there, and uh, she's pretty fired up about what I'm going to do. Father, we want to thank you. Uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for the leaders that you uh, really blessed us with. Thanks for all the different flights and all the different details that have gone in. Thanks for the thousands of prayer hours that have gone into praying for these, these ministers who uh, give and give and give and give. But, God, the truth be known, there's uh, so many things that are needed from you. We are desperate need for your presence tonight. There are, uh, there are hurts, there are marriages that are in trouble, there are pastors that want to quit, there, are, there is sin that needs to be repented of, there's so many things that only you can do. Musicians can't do it, the speakers can't do it, the Spirit of God can do it, and we ask that you would uh, come to us in the next day and a half in a mighty, mighty way, that unmistakable mark that God has visited with his people. Uh, thank you for the grace we find in Jesus Christ, thank you for the mercy Thank you for John chapter 1 that was quoted by Marquis that just got us focused right off the bat. So our prayer is that these next few minutes that your children would show you how fired up we are about who you are. And uh, again, thank you for these, the talent that's on the platform music-wise. God, thank you for their hearts. Thank you for the way that they, their, their sole desire is that Jesus Christ would be lifted up. And God, that's going to solve everything that we brought into this room tonight. We love you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, stand to your feet if you would.
altar of our praise let there be no higher name jesus son of god you laid down your perfect life you are the sacrifice jesus son of god on the altar of our praise let there be no higher name jesus son of god you laid down your perfect life you are the sacrifice jesus son of god you are jesus son of god we lift it higher than all you owe
Great to see you here tonight. Thank you, Pastor Bruce, for all that you have done, for Pastor Clint, Pastor Alex, who have helped you. And let's give it up to the glory of God for the great Biltmore Church. Would y'all do it? Come on, join me with me, all right? Lord, my heart was so thrilled when Bruce told me the, the title of this entire program and ministry experience. And our prayer tonight in the name of Jesus is that you will do what their heart has desired. Show us your glory. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. Missionaries Jim and Elizabeth Elliott were inspired to follow God's call to Ecuador through the life and the ministry of missionary Amy Carmichael. In fact, as most of you are well aware, their call to Ecuador cost Jim his life along with four of his missionary colleagues. In Elizabeth Elliott's book entitled, A Chance to Die, The Life and the Legacy of Amy Carmichael, she states these words about Amy Carmichael. 
She said, Amy Carmichael's great longing was to have a single eye for the glory of God. Now think about that statement with me for a moment. A single eye for the glory of God. A single eye full of simplicity, but yet extreme purity. For one thing and one thing alone, and that was for the glory of God. For over 50 years, Carmichael ministered as a missionary, demonstrating that single eye in the nation of India to the glory of the Lord. Not letting anyone blur her vision at all or distract her from God's calling to reach the nations. Let me ask you tonight, does our Southern Baptist Convention not need to experience a single eye for the glory of God? Do we need to experience a single eye for the glory of God? When we have 60% of our churches who did not baptize anyone from the age of 12 to 17? Do we need a single eye for the glory of God? When we have 80% of our 46,125 churches that did not baptize or did baptize anyone from zero, which is none, to one of people who are ages 18 to 29. Do we not have and have a great need for the glory of God to come upon us in a fresh way when over 25% of our churches did not report one single person being reached and baptized for the glory of God? And do we not need a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit when we know that a year ago we had experienced as a convention of churches the worst drop in baptisms in 62 years. And now, this year, just reported a few days ago, we're down another 1.46 from the other negative stat a year ago. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to listen to these words tonight. This means that this is the lowest number of baptisms in the history of the Southern Baptist Convention since 1948, when we know that Baptist President Harry Truman was in the White House. Now, what is even more tragic is that in 1948, we had 146 million Americans, and today we have 320 million Americans, and yet we continue to fall away and not reach people the way we need to reach people for the Lord. I'm telling you, we need a fresh portion of the glory of God. And when you know that just under 1,000 Southern Baptist churches close every year, and when you know that financial giving in many Southern Baptist churches is down from a year before. Now, let me say these words to you tonight with, with, with deep humility. We cannot deny where we are. Would you agree with that? I mean, we can't just look the other way and act like it will go away. I declare to you tonight in the name of Jesus, the greatest need in the Southern Baptist Convention is to see a great awakening, to see a mighty move of the Spirit of God to come upon this nation for the first time in over 100 years. And our greatest need is pastors, pastors' wives, laypersons, churches. And our greatest need, we know, in the entire SBC tonight, I want to spend a few moments speaking to you about. I want to talk to you tonight about God's glory distinguished by it or distanced from it. Which one are we? Are we distinguished by the glory of God or could we be distanced from it? If you have a copy of God's Word, would you look with me to the 33rd chapter of the book of Exodus tonight? Exodus 33. And I want to read this evening, beginning with verse 12. 
And I would like to read through verse number 18. Would you stand in honor of the Holy Word of God tonight? The Bible says these words, chapter 33 of Exodus, verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, look, you have told me, lead this people up. But you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, if I indeed found favor in your sight, please teach me your ways, and I will know you and find favor in your sight. Now, consider that this nation is your people, God, or Moses tells God. And then the Lord replied, he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. If your presence does not go, Moses responded to him, don't make us go up from here. How will it be known that I and your people have found favor in your sight unless you go with us? I and your people will be distinguished by this from all the other people on the face of the earth. And the Lord answered Moses, I will do this very thing you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. And then Moses said, please let me see your glory. Lord, bless the word of God tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. We need a single eye for the glory of God. Just as Jesus prevails in prayer for us every day, Moses prevailed in prayer for the people of God. Do we? And just as Jesus granted favor and grace to his people, Moses pursued the favor and the grace of God upon the people. Do we? And just as Jesus saves us and sets us apart by the power of his spirit, it was Moses here in this passage who wanted not only deliverance from the enemies, but it was Moses here who wanted to be known to have the presence of God upon his life. Do we? And just as Jesus was and is the glory of God, the glory as of the one and only Son from the Father, Moses wanted to see more than anything in his life the glory of God. Do we? Question, what is the glory of God? The glory of God is the presence of God. Moses sought Moses wanted any, nothing more than to ensure that the presence of God would come upon the people and that that would become their distinctive mark in their culture. Jesus is the glory of God. And anytime we want the gospel to go to the ends of the earth, we are saying that we want the Lord Jesus and his glory to be absolutely felt into all of the nations of the world. So what I do know is this, is that we will either be distinguished by the presence of God in our lives and our ministries, or we will be distanced from the presence of God in our lives and our ministries. What about you? Where are you tonight? What does that word distinguished mean there in verse number 16? It means to be different different. It means to be separate from. It means to be distinct from. It means to be marked out. In other words, we are marked out as being people with the glory and the presence and the power of God in our lives. Set apart, marvelously separate. Moses knew in his heart that the presence and the glory of God, ladies and gentlemen, was the only thing that would make them different at all compared to their enemies. Moses knew that the enemies there in Canaan land, they would have land and they would have possessions. And he knew that God would give them land and God would give them possessions. But Moses knew more than anything that in reality, the only thing that would separate them would be the powerful glory of God and the presence of the Lord upon their lives. 
So Moses knew more than anything that if they were going to be known for anything, God make us known for being people with the presence of God. Moses participated, I want to call tonight, in three actions in the book of Exodus. Action number one, Moses practiced going up. Going up. When you look at the book of Exodus, let me share with you tonight, it is really one long conversation between God and between Moses. We would call that in our lives prayer. Would you not agree? I mean, I want you to know tonight that that's exactly what was going on here. Let me illustrate for you. You can look in your Bible or you can listen for a moment. But in Exodus chapter 19, verse 20, notice what happened. Moses went up the mountain at Sinai, then God sent him down to the people. And then God called him back up to talk with him and then sent him back down the mountain with the commands of God. And then when the people were distant, You know what Moses did? He went back up to be with God again. Exodus 21 through 31, you read these words so much in the story that Moses was sent back down the mountain and then he would share the ordinances and the laws and the code of conduct for everyone. Question, where did Moses get that? He got it from going up to be with God talking to God, hearing God, and obeying God in his life. And he wrote it all down so he could tell the people. Then you get to Exodus chapter 32. The people believed that Moses was delayed from coming down the mountain. In fact, they told Aaron, Aaron, we're not sure he's ever going to come back. And so they appealed to Aaron to go and to make a God. And what did Aaron do? Aaron made a golden calf. And that became their God, and they began to to worship that God. And then God sent Moses down the mountain. And listen to what happened. When Moses saw what was going on, this disastrous idolatry that was going on, guess what he did? He went back up the mountain, interceded with the Father, begging God not to take away the people of God. Then, with the word of God, he went back down the mountain, seeing the people worshiping the calf and dancing and partying, and he approached Aaron. Now, here is Aaron. Guess where Aaron is? Aaron is with the people, demonstrating poor leadership, distant from the presence and the power of God, not being what he needed to be as a spiritual leader. And guess what happened? Moses, when he saw him and he talked to him, he saw that the people were out of control. It burned Moses, it grieved Moses, and he went back up the mountain to talk to God. And then we come to Exodus 33. What a story. God told Moses to do what? To go down to the, to the people and to tell them, I'm going to give them the promised land just like I said I would. And then what did God tell him? I'm going to send an angel before you. I'm not going with them. I've changed my mind, guys. I'm not going, Moses. These people, they're rebellious. They're distant from me. They don't want to listen to me. They don't want to hear me. And all this grieved the people, and it grieved Moses. Moses placed a tent outside the camp, and when people wanted to talk to God, they'd go to the camp. And every time Moses went into the camp, the Bible says the glory of God, the cloud of God would come on him. And he would walk in that tent, listen to this, and he would talk to God just like God was a friend. And he would talk to him what? Face to face. He left. Joshua stayed. He couldn't leave the tent. God was getting him ready. Where? In the presence of God. And then you find in the story this remarkable thing that Moses went back and he talked to God and he told God, God, you wanted me to lead this people up, but if you're not going, I'm not sure I want to go. They're your people, God. You've got to do something. And God said, okay, I'll give you my presence. And then Moses appealed to him, God, are you sure? God, more than anything, I I, I want our people, this people, to be known and distinguished by the presence of God and the power of God and the glory of God more than anything. And God, we want to see 
your glory. And with great conviction, he cried out to God in the midst of his prayer, Lord, show us your glory. Pastors, we're far too content sometimes to do ministry away from and apart from the powerful presence and glory of God. We need God to show us his glory in this conference this week. And when you really cut it, here's what you find. There's only one thing that distinguishes you from other leaders, the presence and the glory of God being all over you. And you only receive this extraordinary touch from the Father. You only receive this this power from on high when you're willing to do what? When you're willing to go up to be with the Father. Going up might cost you a few days of fasting and prayer. Going up may cost you an early morning to meet with God. Going up will cost you the discipline of every day, trying to get on your face before the Lord and cry out to God and beg God, give me a word, give me a word, give me a word. And God, if you don't show up, I don't even want to preach. I want you to show up. The only thing that separates us, puts us apart, makes us different, is the glory of God. Now, Gene and I, we have been blessed with six grandchildren. One of our grandchildren is named Jack. Jack is four years old today. We wished him happy birthday earlier, FaceTimed with him. And you know what the interesting thing about Jack? About a year ago, Jack got hungry. And Jack knew exactly what he wanted, and he knew where it was in the refrigerator. He couldn't find mom. He decided he was going to go on his own and get it. So Jack opened the door. Unknown to Jack, his mom is standing back behind him and watching what he does. Jack paid the price. He had to go up in the refrigerator, on the inside of the refrigerator, and scale the heights of the refrigerator to get one slice of cheese. I want you to see this picture. Look at that. Honest to God, that's a real picture. It's amazing it did not break and hurt himself, but he scaled the heights. I'm telling you, that's what we need to do as men and women of God. We need to be willing to go up, go up, go up to have the glory and the power and the presence of God. But there's a second action he did coming down. Oh, listen, Moses also came down. The scripture talks about this powerful principle of coming down. What do I mean? We see it all over Exodus. I tried to demonstrate it a moment ago. Moses was coming down to be with the people continually. But listen carefully. He was only willing to come down to be with the people after he had gone up to be with God. A word about the people. They were distanced from God. A word about Aaron distant from God. Hey, you know what? There are times in ministry where ministry wears us out. There are times when we just get beat up on, accused, ridiculed, lied about, written about, emailed about. I mean, we just get worn out. And sometimes we're like Elijah where we believe we're the only one in the world living and loving God. You ever get there in your life? Well, I want to tell you, We're not the only ones. God always has a tribe. He always has a remnant. But when we're in the midst of that, you know where we are? We're distant. I mean, we're just not where we ought to be with God. And when you look at the life of Aaron and you look at the life of Israel, it is quite interesting because we all get here sometime. Because here's what happens. When you're not where God wants you to be, here's what goes on. You don't think right. You don't act right. You don't live right. And you don't lead right. That's why we need a fresh touch of the glory of God. That's why we have to always practice going up to be with God, going up to be with God. Just a thought, whatever it's worth today in your life as a leader, in our day, we hear much more about coming down to be with the people than we do about going up to be with God. 
We hear words like this all the time. We read blogs like this. We, we, we read stories about this. If you're not with the people, how will you know what to preach? If you're not with the people, how will you know what they want? If you're not with the people, how are you going to know where to lead them? Now, listen, I'm not discounting any of that. Those things in and of themselves are very, very important. But could it be we're getting what we're getting in our churches at times and getting ourselves as a convention at times because we're a lot more committed to being down with the people more than we're willing to be up with God? Could that be one of our challenges? Maybe that's why we're wrestling with the culture that we're dealing with in our churches, the carnality that we all face continually. Listen, coming down to be with the people is important, but much more important is going up to be with God. It all depends on what you want to be set apart and known for in your ministry. Some of us would rather be known for the way we dress or the kind of music we sing or our style of preaching or the way we choose to live more than being known to be distinguished by the powerful presence and the glory of God. Remember, the power of God is not found in coming down the mountain. The power of God is found in your life and your ministry by going up to be with God. Interesting about old Moses, he would not come down the mountain to be with the people until he had been up with God, had a word from God, had a message of God, had the presence of God, and had the power of God. And then he would come down to be with the people. We need to go back to that in our lives. The future of our leadership and the future of our church and the future of the Southern Baptist Convention will be discovered by one thing and one thing alone, us going up to be with God. You see, there are two spiritual realities we just cannot get away from. It doesn't matter who we are, what we do in life. We cannot lie to ourselves. We must understand the reality. Here's one of them. There is no great movement of God that ever occurs that is not first preceded by the extraordinary prayer of God's people. That's going up to be with God. Moses constantly in his life demonstrated extraordinary prayer. Prayer beyond the ordinary. Prayer beyond the ordinary. Whatever your ordinary is, it's just praying more about that in our lives. You can study any element of church history, any element of any movement of God in the scripture. It is always preceded by the extraordinary prayer of God's people. And pastor, pastor's wife, church leader, lay person tonight, listen very carefully to the second reality. God can do more in a moment than you can ever do in a lifetime. And you've got to know that. And where do you get that? Going up to be with God. And then when you come down to be with the Lord, you are absolutely confident that God has spoken and you're really ready at that point to hear from the Lord. Oh, listen, we need to come to the point to realize that some of us have a heart to be so real with people that if we just think we're, if we're cool enough, we're going to get it. Listen carefully. We are never going to be cool enough to win our town our rural setting, to win our cities, to win the nation, to win the world, to win the nations. We're never going to be cool enough. The only thing that's going to happen to bring that is a mighty movement of the Spirit of God that comes only when we are going up to be with God. Going up, coming down, leading forward is the third action of Moses. He was a man who was committed to leading forward. Are you leading forward in your ministry and in your life? Moses made it very clear to God, I am not going forward without your glory. I am not 
going forward without your presence. Forward leaders, they understand something. They are distinguished by the powerful presence of God and the glory of God in their lives and in their ministries. Now let's just also get real with one another tonight. Some leaders are distinguished by their charisma relationally. Some leaders are distinguished by their intellect, by their brilliance intellectually. Some leaders are distinguished by their discipline physically. And some leaders are distinguished by their smile personally. And I want to tell you about all of those things called charisma and brilliance and discipline and smile. Not that I have them, but here's what I know. All of those are your friends if you have them. Treat them as friends. God has entrusted them to you. But listen to me. If that's all you have, you have very, very little to offer. Because the only thing we ultimately have to offer is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the power of God unto salvation, doing it, demonstrating it, living it, sharing it, telling it, preaching it in the power and the glory of the Holy Spirit of God. That is what sets us apart as the people of God. Oh, listen tonight. If we bank on those things or things like those, and that's all we've got, dear friends, listen tonight, then we're going to have ministries a lot more like Aaron than Moses. Which would you rather have it in your life? You want to be like Aaron or you want to be like Moses? Do you want to be like the people of Israel when they're distant from God or the people of Israel when they're experiencing the glory of God and the power of God? And every one of our churches, every one of us as leaders, we have that enormous privilege in our life. What do we want to be known for? We hear a lot about legacy today, legacy this, legacy that. If you're younger, it's living legacy. If you're old, it's legacy or you're dead. That's all you got left. Well, listen, the greatest thing we can be known for is not for our preaching skill, not even for our ability to break apart the Word of God. The only thing that we want to be known for ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, should be that we are men and women that do believe the book, that we do have the message of the gospel, but the distinguishing mark on us is the glory of God is with us, and we're not going forward without His glory. And you know what needs to happen here tonight? Some of you need to get there in your life and your ministry. Some of you need to get there before you leave this conference, even perhaps tonight. Some of you are sick and tired of being sick and tired of preaching. Probably about a fourth of the time, what is called now Interstate 49, or the way I go home with my wife every Sunday after a long Sunday, I resign about one-fourth of those Sundays. Okay, does anybody relate to that? I mean, listen, I, I, I know what it's like. I've been doing this for a while. And it doesn't matter whether you're in a rural church, doesn't matter whether you're in a small membership church in a small town like I grew up in. I grew up in a very small church running 30 to 40 on a given Sunday. I mean, I had to be ready in season, out of season, because when the preacher said, Ronnie, why don't you come and sing a song? I got to get ready, man. Or Ronnie, why don't you come and preach tonight? Anybody grow up in a church like that? That's the kind of church I grew up in. I understand the way that works. Or you're a county seat town pastor, or maybe you're in one of our metropolitan areas. It doesn't really matter about the size of your church. What really matters is the size of your heart for God, and the size of your heart for the gospel, and the size of your heart to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what matters. And I want to say to you tonight, the only thing we have to really offer is one thing, and that's the glory of God. Now, can I take you back for a moment to missionary Amy Carmichael? What was she known for? To have a single eye for the glory of 
God. Let me ask you tonight, what do you have a single eye for? Where are your eyes? Where are they? What's important to you? What's priority to you? What is it? Is it your personality? Some of you are unbelievable personally. I mean, you got it and you know it. I mean, you have an incredible personality. I can name a few of you here I see tonight. You've got it, man. You're blessed. Some of you are counting on your personality. Some of you are counting on the people you know. Boy, if I, just, I, I know him or I know her, man, I, I got that down. I mean, you're, you're, so, you're so caught up in that. I can't wait till, I can't wait till. Be careful. The most important person you know is Jesus. Spend time getting to know him. And some of you are caught up in position. I mean, man, you're really caught up in it. If I just had this position, if I had this church, or if I just had that church, oh, it would be so awesome. I'll never forget years ago in this conference, Charles Stanley stood and he talked to thousands of pastors who were there that night. And he said, all you pastors, you want to go to the, to the church over there where the greener grass is. You give your lives to it. You die to do it. You'll walk on anybody in the world to get there. But you forget that to the guy that just left that place that you see as greener grass, it was all brown grass to him. We all need to remember it's not in a position. It's not in a person. It's not in the people we know. It's not in our sterling, unique, wonderful personalities. Because the only thing that distinguishes, I mean, can I get an amen tonight? The only thing that distinguishes us is not our personality. They're a dime a dozen. The people we know, everybody else knows them. The positions we have are one in our lives. Somebody probably has them anyway. But the only thing that we want to be known for is the power and the glory of God. Do you believe that tonight? Do you believe that? Is that what you want? And some of you tonight, before you leave this conference, I'm telling you, some of you before Wednesday night is over and you get in that car, you get on that plane on Thursday, some of you need to make a commitment. God, I am not going to get up to preach this week if I don't have a fresh anointing and a fresh power of the glory of God. I'm not getting up there. And God, I don't even want to go back if you're not going back with me in a powerful way. I mean, I'm telling you, we need to see the glory of God this week. I close with this statement tonight. Forward leaders, that's what all of us need to become. Remember, going up, coming down, leading forward. Forward leaders need to be distinguished by going up to be with God, coming down to be with the people, and leading forward with the power and the presence and the glory of God. That is the kind of leader I want to be. And I pray that's the kind of leader and that's the kind of church and that's the kind of ministry you want to have in the name of Jesus. May it happen for the glory of God this week in your life and in your ministry. Bless you tonight. God bless all of you. Praise the Lord. Amazing. Right on the